right, now I, I want to give a little disclaimer before I begin this message series uh, and explain to you that, please hear me out so you don't get upset, the, there's going to be a little delay in bringing forth the message, the days of vengeance which I have planned, I had planned for this week and the following week. There's going to be a little delay in that. That's because as I was preparing it and working on it last night, I felt the Lord had said to me, I can't have you deliver that without something giving a segue. I need you to give a segue to the understanding of my nature. Because some of the things that I'm going to say in those two messages and in this one are going to be hard to hear and could sound um, offensive because you may never have heard of God in some of these ways. So you need to brace yourself. You say, yeah, but I, I don't care, brother, as long as you got scripture to prove what you're saying. Well, I have an abundance of scripture and I don't have to give it all to you in this particular segment, but I will give you enough that you will see what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna give you that little segue. segue. Um, Let me begin by opening up this particular thought, this question. What is our ultimate purpose? You, you might have some ideas. Maybe you've heard that terminology in other places, and that's good. I know I have stated it several times. I know Chet has stated it several times. Pam has stated it several times. But sometimes these things, even as important as that question, what is our ultimate purpose, sometimes slip by us, and we go about our regular life and totally don't even think about it. But I want to let you know what our purpose in life is. Now, there's a lot of details to it, but in its capital form, this is what it is. It is to know God and to make him known. To know God and to make him known. When we know God, we need to then make him known. We need to know his nature and his person. And because we have been made partakers of his nature, we then need to therefore walk according to that knowing and in that knowing. Psalm 85, 11 and 12 say this. Grace and truth have met together. Justice and peace have kissed each other. I want you to think of these terms because in some senses they may seem or sound like they're diametrically opposed to each other. And in some senses they are. Grace and truth have met together. Justice and peace have kissed each other. Truth springs up from the earth and justice looks down from heaven. Now that scripture is something I want to get known in your your mind. Now, with that going, we're going to take a peek at exploring the nature of God, the perfect balance of grace and truth. That's the title of this message. Exploring the nature of God, the perfect balance of grace and truth. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Every time I see that verse laid out in front of me, I can't help but sing it. There's an old song. I bet you a few of you could join me. And it says this, Beloved of God, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not, loves not God, for God is love. We love, (laughs) 
Let us love one another. First John 4, 7 and 8. Yeah, it's Sunday school. <laughs> That's where that one came from. Teach your kids that, and they get the beginning of the nature of God right in their lives. Okay? If you, if you ask me, I'll come to your house and sing it to your kids. <laughs> but focus on the last line of that song. For God is love. It's not just that God is loving, but he is love. He is love. But how does that define itself? Because if you and I are called by purpose to know God and to make him known, then we need to know this God in whom we serve and in whom we depend and in whom we trust and in whom we have faith in. We need to know God. The days of ignorance for a believer, friends, are over. And in the days ahead, I believe we are heading for turbulent times. And to be honest, the plane is already rocking. There is turbulence in the air. There is trouble in paradise. There is difficulty on the edge and over the horizon. And I think as testimonials and as examples and witnesses for Jesus, those who make him known need to know God. It's an old prophecy in the book of Daniel that says this. Speaking of the latter days, it says, many shall fall in those days, but some for refining and some by the sword. But those who know their God shall do great exploits. Those who know their God. So the qualifier of making him known and doing great things is based on those who know their God. We've been teaching in Bible study and in some other uh, sessions here uh, for, on Sunday regarding the importance of knowing the difference between knowledge or gnosis, gnosis with a G in front, or experiential knowledge, which is epinosis. And this is true in knowing God. There, you can know all about God. You can sing all about God. You can read all about God. Re hey, read all about it. You can read all about God. You can get to know God from hearing messages or from talking to one another. And that is knowing about God. It's knowing God, honestly, having the knowledge of God. But if that knowledge doesn't lead you to pursue epinosis, really knowing God, knowing him intimately, knowing him personally, and enough that you would place your faith in him. Like the guy who stood in front of a large crowd over the Grand Canyon and they strung a huge tight wire and he would wheel a wheelbarrow across that line and everybody would see it and he'd get halfway through and then the wind would blow and, but he'd go on and go on and he'd get it across and people would applaud and go, hey, you're the best, you're the best. And he goes, do you believe I can do this? He goes, I just saw you do it. Do you really believe I can do this? Yeah, I believe you can do it. I'm going to do it again. You want to see that being done again? Yeah, I want to see it. Do you really believe I can do this? Yeah, man. He goes, well, then get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> Let's try this again. <laughs> you see, because there's a difference between <laughs> believing up here or knowing something and knowing something. Just like there's a difference, as I said a few weeks ago, the difference between knowing your wife is pregnant and her knowing she's pregnant because she experiences it on a whole nother level. Amen? Okay. So God is love. This we have to have as a foundation. God is love. This is not the only scripture, however, that teaches us that God is love. There are many, but this one is quite clear, isn't it? For God is love, it says. God is love. There's no room for doubt. Well, what about when God does things? God is love. There's no room for doubt. What about when he judges nations and judges people and, ju and, and, and things happen? God is love. And every time he does do a judgment or an action that you might find apprehensible or whoa, whoa, you must understand that God's nature doesn't change. And so every act he ever does in judgment is after it has been processed thoroughly 
through mercy. For example, God may, in his mercy, remove the cancer out of a body to save the rest of the body. Right? And so there are times that God enacts. You have a story in the book of Acts, chapter 5, where Ananias and Sapphira, now, now <laughs> this is tough bringing this up, but I'm going to bring it up, okay? And I'm not trying to get something across to you on this particular point. Well, I am, actually. That's why I'm making the point. But I'm not trying to get a secret thought behind it upon you. It's about money, and it's about giving, okay? In the, in the beginning days of the church, they had great needs, and they said, we got to have, we got to raise up money. We got to raise up money for the churches in Jerusalem. We got to, you know, they're, 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 a lot of the people who work there are out of work and the church should have some money to help with supplies and help with food and help with living. And so people started saying, I, I, I got some money saved up. I'm going to give that to, to God. I'm going to give that to the church. A lot of people did that. A lot of people worked extra hard and earned more money and brought their money in and said, here, let this honor God and honor the church. Um, some people, the Bible says, sold their second homes. What? I thought people lived in huts. No, those are the Indians. <laughs> those, are, those, are not, uh, those are not the, um, uh, the common people of, of that day of Israel. They had little houses. And some people had more than one. And some of them sold their houses and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet and said, whatever the need is. And it says they had all things in common and they shared all things. They shared their money, they shared their finances. And then one group, a husband and a wife, stood up and said in front of everybody, I'm going to give such and such sum of money. I'm gonna sell my house and I'm gonna give such and such set of money. And everybody probably had like, ooh, aren't they wonderful? Aren't they, they're so good. They're so, what a blessing. Well, they're rich, so they probably can do that. Good for them. Da, 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 blah, blah, blah. Who knows what they said? So they told that to the apostle Peter. What happened was a little later on, the guy and the wife sold the house and got a certain amount of money for it. And they said this, when that, whatever we get for the house, we're going to give what we get. If we sell it for, let's say, $16,000, we'll downsize for the time being. Let's say it was $16,000. Well, then when we come to church, we're going to give you exactly what we got. Well, according to the scripture and the secret of the Holy Spirit that he revealed is that they got like 25000 Now, I'm just making up figures to carry the point. They got like 25000 on the sale. And when they came time to come to church... They didn't tell anybody how much they got on the sale, so they brought in a certain amount, much less than what they got for it, and said, here's what we got. Let us honor the Lord. And all the people, all the witnesses said, oh, such faithful people, such good people. And they're like, it's our honor. But the Holy Spirit whispered in the ears of Peter and said, they're lying. To make a long story short, short, he confronted them in front of everybody and the husband died right on the spot. After he proved it to him, he said, you have not lied unto men, you've lied unto God. And the man dropped dead and gave up the ghost right there, right in church. Talk about a, a worship service turning into a funeral service. And it says men carried him out. Later on, his wife showed up. And Peter challenged her and said, hey, your husband was here a little while ago. And uh, he brought such and such money in from the sale of the house that you guys made a big boast about. Um, is this uh, the amount you got for the house? Oh, yes, yes, it is. And that's what you brought us? Yes, yes, it is. And he says, you too. Did you plot this out together? I mean, why, why would you lie to, to the Holy Spirit? You've not lied unto men, you've lied unto God. And she dropped dead right there in the church. 
Now that's a hard thing to hear. It says, but great fear came upon the whole church when that happened. Because everybody was in the good mood of talking about the sweetness of God, the goodness of God, the, loveness, the love of God. People say things like, God is good, and everybody says, oh yeah, they were saying it back then too. And they, everybody, but, but I don't think when that happened, that if somebody had st stood up and said, God is good, God is good, and they probably were like, well, who's going to explain that? Because the churches and this church at the time did not understand the nature of God because they were deluded into believing of only one side of the coin. Now, before you gather dust and throw it at me or pick up sticks, please hear the rest. <clears throat> So God is love, and all that God is and does is through love, right? So you have to trust that while our nature seems to fluctuate, his nature does not. He's perfect in nature. He doesn't change. I am the Lord, he says. I do not change. That's one of the greatest things that we depend on is that no matter what the circumstance, we know we can always go to him because he does not change. He's perfect. He does not shift like a shifting shadow. He does not move, and move his nature around in different ways. His nature is whole and perfect and balanced. But if we're not aware of that perfection of that balance, then we could be confused about our perception of God. We might think that we're serving Santa Claus who just wants to give out good gifts and closes his eyes towards our naughtiness. But Santa doesn't do it, and neither does God. No, I'm not making a case for Santa. Some people believe that if you are perfect in love, as God is, or perfected by love, as God does with us, it is impossible to hate. Makes sense. But is that true? Can love and hate be in the same heart? I think our first answer would be, no. If you love, you must not hate. And we're living in a, a generation now where anything that is spoken of in a derogatory way towards anything or anyone it is now considered, and becoming worse and worse, considered hate speech. If you show any dissent or disagreement or any disparaging comments, and sometimes just anything just negative, there are attempts to shut down that and say you are guilty of hate speech. Am I making that up? Even if you agree with it or don't agree with it, I'm not making it up. It is the generation we're in. But is it true that if you are perfected in love as God is, that you cannot hate, that you can't have hate in your heart? No, it's not true. Listen to this proverb from the wisest man who ever lived outside of Jesus, Solomon, King Solomon, first son of, or second son of King David, actually. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, it says this. There are six things the Lord hates. Hates. What? The perfect God? Perfect love? Perfectly hates. Seven things that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes or a proud look. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked schemes or plans. Feet that are quick to rush into evil. A false witness who pours out lies and a person who stirs up strife among the brothers. Seven things in all 
that God absolutely detests, abhors, hates. So God hates some things. Now I want you to see that perfect love can also perfectly hate. Here is a lesser known verse. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. While you're still thinking about God is love, found in 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Here is a lesser known verse. Our God is a consuming fire. Period. Not God gives out fire, acts in fire, lives in fire. He is fire. Now, we don't need a theological explanation on that right now. I just want you to get the impact of that direct statement. Our God is a consuming fire. You remember when Moses saw God in the form that God chose, and he chose a burning bush, a bush that burned, and the bush was not consumed, but the bush was burning, and God spoke to him out of that bush. Here's a point. You see in John's passage of declaration that God is love, and with this passage in Hebrews, asserting that our God is a consuming fire is actually perfectly balanced with God's nature. As we all know, a fire can both be comforting and destructive, right? It all depends on how close you approach to it and when you stand in relation to it, where you stand in relation to it. In this sense, it's fair to say love and hate are really two sides of the same coin. Take it further, okay? You can't truly love a specific quality or attribute without hating its opposite. Therefore, it only stands to reason if we truly love God. Now, we're going to go through a little bit of an ex exercise in psychology. Just kind of bear with me especially those of you who like that. Therefore, it only stands to reason if we truly love God, we should truly strive to love like he loves. I mean, doesn't that make sense? If we truly love God, we should truly try to love like he loves. Right? I mean, we should love all people. Anybody believe that? We should love all people? <laughs> See, some of you are getting afraid to answer that. Going, well, wait a minute. He could snap back at me in five seconds. I think I'll just hold my tongue and see what they say. No, you, you, can, you can feel comfortable. Answer the way you know to answer and how you believe you should be answering. So, we should love all people because God loves all people. And I agree with that, by the way. And we should also love all things that he loves. Doesn't that make sense, too? If God loves something, I, 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 I want to love it, too. I want to get in on that going, oh, you love that, God? I love it too. And that's good. I'm glad that we're like that. We should love what God loves. Now here's the perfect balance. And here's where you throw a rock at me. <laughs> if we truly love God and love the things that he loves, then we should not only love what God loves, but we should also hate what he hates. Because that would be perfect balance. And if we're exploring the nature of God, we're looking for the perfect balance. That would be it. Now, here is a problem for us believers because while we certainly do love God, and I know we do, we love the things that he loves. We don't really hate the things that he hates, though. Maybe because we think that we can't love and hate from the same nature meaning from God's nature. Because we certainly do love and do hate from our own nature all the time, right? I mean, you hate some things. I hate certain things. And I love certain things. And you love certain things. And you're doing it from your own nature. So don't let it be surprised. The Bible says we were made in his image and his likeness. So you didn't get that on your own. You're copying your father. So don't get weird now 
when exploring his nature, you discover things that he hates that you love. (laughs) Now you're getting where I'm going with some of this. You see, in discovering God's nature means it might upset your nature because you don't want to think like that. You don't want to think, well, God actually hates things. Well, now I'm showing you in Scripture, yeah, he does. And there are some things he hates really bad. And so the plot thickens. It also turns out if we get real that many of the things that we do love, God actually hates. Yikes. Yes, strangely enough, upon closer examination, there are actually, there may actually be many things that we love that God actually hates. I'm going to tell you a little story of two social workers. There were two social workers who were in uh, the, the playground of the daycare, and they saw a bunch of little children who were playing and stuff like that, and they saw, they saw a little boy um, that was filthy and muddy and all kinds of dirty and stuff like that, and one social worker said to the other social worker, you know, you know what the problem is right there, my friend? And they said, What's, what was that? said, that, that, that parent of that child, she must not love her child. I mean, to let her child get all dirty like that, she must not really love her child. And the other social worker said, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, she loves her child. She just don't hate dirt. And think on that. Of course, there are also maybe plenty of other things that we hate or dislike that God actually loves. Did you know it can reverse itself? There's a lot of things that we actually hate and don't like. But God loves it. I mean, we, may, we might not really like the time of worship. I'm just being honest on some things. Maybe the whole, this whole thing about the music and the lifting up hands or singing with your voice or anything like that, well, that all looks good, looks kind of churchy, but, you know, I'm not a fan of that and I'm not too big into that. I don't really care for it. I don't really like it. It doesn't really mean much to me. I just want to kind of get to the message, buddy. Get to the message. Enough of this singing. (laughs) Some people like that when it comes to giving. Financially. To help support the church, they'll be like, all right, right, we got to waste our time on this. Get past that. And God is up there going, no, I love when you give. And I love when you worship. Now, if you're new here, or this is your first time, you don't have to worry. I'm not after your money. I hardly ever talk about it. It's not a subject I feel very comfortable with. I know how temperamental people are on that subject, and I know about the snakes and the the charlatans out there who have raked and robbed the people of God. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just common support according to the Scripture supporting the church you attend and receiving from that, that you honor the Lord with your giving. God loves that. The Bible says he loves a cheerful giver. Notice it didn't say big, big mama giver. He didn't say, you know, someone who gives all of their treasure. He said he loves a cheerful giver. It's the attitude of the heart. If you give reluctantly or give out of compulsion, ah, that preacher makes me give. I'm tired of it. Well, God hates that. Keep your gift because it ain't doing anything. I told you, you may not like some of the things I'm saying. But if you change your heart and attitude to be more balanced like God's and you say, no, I I, want to give and I want to do things that God loves. God loves a cheerful giver. Well, I'm going to give cheerfully. When the pastor says, hey, it's time for the offering, I'm going to give cheerfully. I'm going to give happily. The Bible says, let everyone give as God has purposed in their heart to give, not out of compulsion, right? Not out of reluctance, but cheerfully, for God loves a cheerful giver. So if you, if you, if you can handle that, you can get some of that balance, it'll set you free. You say, well, are you talking about money? I'm not talking about money. This sermon's not about money. I'm talking about balance in the perfect nature of God 
and recognizing how God sees things and how God operates, that can infect us. Because the Bible says we're partakers of his divine nature. That means you have a partner. You're not just living on your old nature anymore, thank heavens, right? Because you just do anything you want. But see, now you're partaking of God's nature. And there's some checks and balances in that because God is all balanced. Okay. So you see, if this is the case, then number one, we don't understand God's nature too well. If we're not getting this, we aren't, as a result, walking in it very well either. See, it's important to understand the nature of God. And if you're, if, if you're not getting what I'm saying, or, or, if you, or if we're like that, where we love things that he hates and hate things that he loves, well, we're not getting his nature very well, and that actually has an effect on our walk. Because our perspective of God is, well, I don't want to jump ahead. But I almost said it (laughs) we'll talk about it in a minute so in other words this will have a real effect on our spiritual lives and understanding and thus it will affect our walk remember this passage John 8 32 Jesus said and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free (laughs) Truth is, we don't, if we don't know the truth of a matter, we won't be free in the matter either. If we don't know and understand the truth of the nature of God, it will have a dual effect on us. Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you don't know the truth of the nature of God, you won't be free. That means you, in certain ways you'll be walking in bondage, hindered, uh, inhibited, lacking movement, lacking progression, suffering, because you won't be growing, you won't be maturing, and you won't change. How many here want to change? How many have declared, change me, he changed me in 2023? Still standing on that, aren't you? Me too. Okay, well, know the truth. Know the truth of God's nature because that truth will set you free, removing those chains, removing those hindrances and let you walk so much better. And when the things come up going, I don't know about if God is like that. I don't think that that's fair that God should do that. Wait, wait, are you questioning the perfect balanced nature of God? Or are you getting your nature involved in your perspective here of God? Oh, well, I'm not sure. No, I think you are. I think you are sure. Is anybody bored? Okay. No, I didn't write that down. Ask if anyone's bored. (laughs) No, I didn't. (laughs) Okay, so what is this dual effect? If we don't know or understand the truth of the nature of God, we have a dual effect. What is that? Number one, our representation of him will be at best, there's the word, skewed, or at worst, misleading. This is important. Ready? Our representation of him will be at best skewed and at worst, misleading. The second of the dual effect, our walks with him will lack freedom and therefore cause serious moments Serious moments, this is important, of instability and stumbling. You're going to keep stumbling around. You're not going to advance from glory to glory or from truth to truth or from faith to faith if you're stumbling around or are unstable because of the dual effect of you not understanding the nature of God. You've got to learn to let God be God. God don't ever change. His way is perfect, and ours is not. But we must surrender to his way. Friends, we must understand the correct biblical worldview of God's nature. Now it's time for an uncomfortable scripture. Say, I really want to hear it, brother. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Well, I got half of you. Let's hear it. 
Did I write it down what, what it was? Romans eleven twenty two. Now consider then both the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen. What? Now this is not fallen like um, someone who has tripped and, and fallen. A mistake, a mess up. This is not talking that kind of falling. This is talking about falling away. Falling away can only take place intentionally. Falling away from truth. Falling away from God. Falling away from balance and becoming imbalanced. And in this particular context, falling away from the nature and the truth of God. He says he's severe to those who do that. But, to, but God's kindness is to those who believe, provided you continue in his kindness. Now, I, I almost didn't want to include the last part or the latter part of that verse so as to not create trouble uh, because I don't want to get off on my point. But this is a heavy scripture, heavy weighted. It's written to the Roman Christians, not to the Jews. It's written to the Roman Christians and it's written to them who had just become Christians who were once pagans. And he says this, God's kindness is to those who believe, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. You say, well, that sounds pretty severe. Yeah, that's what he meant when he said, consider then both the kindness and the severity of God. It's his dual nature or his nature in perfect balance. Paul said in Romans to consider both the kindness and the severity of God. Some ministries, listen carefully, and believers pick one or the other. They either go all the way about the kindness of God while dismissing his severity or the other way around. Paul exhorted us to consider both of them. You know why? Because God's nature doesn't change. It's perfect. Friends, God is perfectly good, but he is also perfectly just. He is kind, but he is also severe. He is merciful, but he is also righteous. He loves, but he also hates. He forgives sin but he also will judge wickedness. He will give grace to those who repent and believe, but he will take vengeance on those who don't. This is the perfect balance of the nature of God. We must understand this. and you could have heard a pin drop. I know this is uncomfortable. I'm not trying to be dramatic. I'm just trying to be honest and be real and take a look at an honest evaluation of the scriptures. And my prayer, my hope, is if I convey this correctly, you won't walk away going, oh, God's severe, God's, God's mean, God's... No, that's not what we're saying. He's not mean. God is so good and he's so loving and, and he just winks at everything and everything is permissible. No, that's not true either. He is a perfect balance of his nature. He is kind, but he's also severe. He is merciful, but he's also righteous. He is love and he loves, but he also hates. He forgives sin, but he also will judge wickedness. He will give grace to those who repent and believe, but he will take vengeance on those who don't. This is the perfect balance of the nature of God. We must understand this. So you see, when I bring forward the messages of vengeance regarding the days of vengeance, you will have a balanced understanding of it and you will understand. Do you see now why it was important for me to give this message first? Because when I start giving you the message on the days of vengeance, you'll be like, holy moly. Is this the God I serve? Is this the God I know? <laughs> but instead you'd be like, hmm, behold, the balance of God. 
perfect in nature. Flights prepare for turbulence. Any, anybody here ever flown and gotten some turbulence? <laughs> I think my wife is telling me a story of her, her most recent flight, one of them where, you know, everything drops and you're like, whoa, and, you know. Well, the, the, the flight people, the flight instructors, try to let people know ahead of time going, turbulent air is coming up and we're going to have some shaking, some rattling, and some rolling. I hope it ain't rolling of a plane. Never looked good. But he said, they would say, these, these things could happen. Please brace yourselves, buckle your safety belt, and so on and so on. Please extinguish all cigarettes. <laughs> all right, you with me? <laughs> so in the same sense, I'm trying to do that for you. The, the, the following messages that I preach... The following message that I preach will be more turbulent than you've probably ever heard from me, unless you were with us when we were at the Cabot House before we bought this building, um, and I preached messages on perilous times. Um, and so that was a little up there too, but this will be even deeper and perhaps a little darker than that. If you really want to get to understand what I'm speaking about, please make sure you're here for those messages. They're very important. Okay, and you might even want to bring a few people but you say, oh, but they didn't hear this message, so oh, they gotta be able to handle it. Well, that's when you have to trust the anointing of the Holy Spirit to allow them to hear what they need to hear and not hear what they cannot handle. That's the goodness of God too, by the way. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now, there are three things you need to know, and I'm preparing to close this message. Three things you need to know of how we can understand the balance of God and the nature of God. Number one, we need to examine our balance. Proverbs 20, 23 says, unequal weights are an abomination to the Lord and false scales are not good. Basically, God hates imbalance. He hates it. He hates when, when we receive things un, unequally or when we are unequal in our evaluation about things. Whether they be principles, whether they be laws, whether they be issues of government, whether they be issues of our life, whether they be lifestyle or approach that anyone may have, you or someone you know. If we have an imbalanced approach to that or an imbalanced understanding, it means we will not reflect the balance of God. And you say, but, and you go right to the other side and say, but God, you, you know, he's, you're saying he's severe, so we got to start telling people that God is severe towards these things or, to, or severe towards that thing or, or God is going to do this or he's going to do that and it's going to be hard. You can't hide that or hold that back because you might, disagree in your nature with God's nature. You need to get your nature in line from imbalance to balance by having his balance. So when you speak of those things that God may be dealing with or may be judging, and if you're doing it right, you will give also the balance of God's love. For example, God loves sinners. but he hates sin. He hates it. And we are not like that because we love a lot of our sin. We coddle it. We pet it. That's a good little sin. That's a good little sin. Yes, and you love mommy and daddy, don't you? And we coddle our sins and we kind of hope he ain't looking. The Bible says, let all those who name the name of Jesus depart from iniquity, depart from evil. And you say, well, 
you've been teaching us for years that that's not easy to do because we can't do it on our own and you got to have the Spirit. To well, absolutely. God doesn't tell us to do anything that he hasn't provided us the power and ability to do. The reason why we can shout, he changed me in 2023 is because he can change you in 2023 if you allow him to walk in you and you walk in him and you will change and you will grow and you will mature and you'll start casting off sins like they were yesterday's garment things that you might have coddled and hugged and petted and treated sweetly went on secret dates with when nobody was looking when you examine your own balance find out where you are unequal in the way you approach life and things and issues that's a good thing that's what you need to know and that's what comes from knowing the nature of God number two examining our belief system our doctrines uh, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, one of the, the youngest pastors ever to, to pastor a church, he said this, keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching or the doctrines that you adhere to. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation, bro, and the salvation of those who hear you. Wow. What does that mean? It means you get affected by that. And it affects other people. This is what I meant in the beginning when I said, when we know God, we then have the responsibility to make him known. And we have the responsibility to make him known according to his balance and his perfect nature, not ours. Say amen or ouch. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. I've heard a million preachers do it. And I never get to do it. But that seems like a good time. Because <laughs> half of you are licking your wounds right now. <laughs> and it's okay. I, I was licking my wounds just before I got here. As God was saying, you know this message is for you too, right? Punk. <laughs> you say, God didn't call you a punk. Well, my foster mother used to call me a punk. <laughs> and that woman loved me. She loved me. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. But she challenged me. So don't get mad at me for challenging you. So yes, keep a close watch on how you live and on the things that you teach and that you say, this is what I believe. I believe this. I believe it. And I will stand on it. Well, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine if you're standing on truth. But if you're just standing on your own opinions about the way life should be and you have not given acquiescence or agreement to this then you unbalanced and you just speaking hot air okay so examine our balance examine our belief system make sure we're lined up with the word and with God's nature and number three examine our motives Psalm 139, 24, and I'm closing. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns and see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That is an, one of the most honest searches you can ever have is when you go before God and say, Lord, I know I tout a good game. I have a certain persona in front of people I have a reputation to uphold and people think I'm this that and the other thing plus a bag of chips <laughs> but the truth is Lord I I got I got some crud going on in me I can't even identify it all but I know some of it is there and I'm asking you to search me oh God Know my inner person, what's going on in me, my workings and the things that I'm holding to and see if there's anything wicked in me and lead me in the way of life everlasting. That's the best of evaluation of your motives, and your actions, the intents of your heart and those things. It's to be honest, be real, like they say in the 12-step program, be true to thine own self. 
Don't lie to yourself. Be honest and evaluate. The scripture says one day we'll stand before God and that's the first thing he's into is bringing out our motives for what we do. Let's pray. Would you stand to your feet, please? God, this is not an easy subject, but I'm so glad you have given me a mature, hungry, earnest people who even though they may not like everything that was said and might even contest it, but they can handle it. They can examine it. They can check it. And maybe, Lord, we can find agreement in your nature. And Lord, if, if, if there are things in us that we have not walked according to your divine nature, God, help us. God, help us. Understand your perfect love and all the attributes of your person, divine and perfect. May our hearts overflow with both love and tremble with fear and awe. Cause us to mature by such knowledge because we want to know you and make you known throughout all the world so that the glory of God will cover the earth just as the waters cover the sea. In Jesus' name, and if you believe it, say, let that be done in me. Go ahead and say it. Let that be done in me. Amen and amen. The second part of this will be next week. I will be preaching it. I want to encourage you, be strong. Be of good courage. Hear the rest of this, and we'll take it from here. God bless. We love you. We look forward to seeing you next time.